everybody. Y'all stand and worship with us this morning. service here at Broadmoor. My name is Amber. I'm worship leader. We also have Eric. Um, we just want to say good morning and wish you the warmest welcome. If this is your first time joining us, please fill out a connection card. That just helps us connect with you better. And we're going to continue to worship this morning. So why don't y'all say good morning to your neighbors and we're going to continue singing. Amen. All right. You've been walking the same old road for miles and miles. You've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies. If you're trying to feel the same old holes inside, there's a better life. There's a better life. If you've got pain, He's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. We've all searched for the light of day in the dead of night. We've all found ourselves worn out from the same old fire. We've all run the things we know just ain't right. But there's a better life. There's a better life. 
If you got pain, he's a pain digger. If you feel lost, he's a rainmaker. If you need freedom, a savior, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain maker. If you believe it, if you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody testify. If you believe it, if you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody testify. Come on, say it If you believe it. You receive it. You can feel it. Somebody testify. If you believe it. If you receive it. If you can feel it. Somebody testify. You got pain. He's a pain taker. And if you feel love. You need freedom, a savior. He's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. Oh, if you need freedom, a savior. He's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. Amen, amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Donnie Wilkinson. I'm one of the pastors here at Broadmoor. We're so grateful that you are with us. Let me share with you a couple of real quick announcements about things that are coming up. On the September 24th, we have our, uh, ne our next guest and new member uh, luncheon. It'll be immediately following this service. And if you have been coming to Broadmoor for a while, and you want to find out more about what's going on, or if you would like to take that next step to become a member of our congregation, we would love for you to come and join us and be a part of that. The information about how you can RSVP is on the screen uh, in front of you. You can get in touch with Amber, let her know, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll get together. We'll share a meal and uh, have a little conversation and see what your next step is. One more announcement on Wednesday is Holy Chow, and we have a special guest speaker, Dr. Robert Mann, who is professor at LSU, the Manship School of Communication. He is an incredible author. He has written a book called Kingfish U, Huey Long and Louisiana State University, and it is just remarkable what he has discovered. You do not know the history of LSU until you have read this book and heard from him. He's an incredible speaker. Uh, that's going to be on Wednesday, September the 20th from 12 to 1 right here in this room. We would love for you to come be a part of that, to, to share a meal and hear some incredible stories from a gifted, gifted storyteller. At this time, I want to invite the kids uh, who are with us. Mr. Connor is in the back. If you'd like to go to Kids Breakout, uh, you can go with him age 5 through 5th grade. Uh, you can go with him, and uh, we'll come back. They'll bring those kids back here a little bit later in the service for us. There's always a lot more going on at our church than we can possibly uh, uh, take time to tell you about. Please sign up for uh, our weekly emails, get involved, connected with us through social media, uh, all of those sorts of ways so that you can stay informed. As we continue with our time of prayer, I invite you to turn your palms up in your lap to close your eyes, to take a few easy, gentle breaths, and together, let us pray. I invite you to begin this time of prayer by giving thanks to God for three personal blessings that you are conscious of and grateful for. 
this morning. I invite you to ask God to bless three people that you know, three people that you believe need an extra measure of God's grace and healing and love in their life. Ask God to give them strength and peace, healing and courage. I invite you to allow God's Holy Spirit to help you review the past 24 hours and to ask for forgiveness for specific mistakes or sins, places where you missed the mark, and ask for the strength to forgive others. I invite you to pray for one person that you have a hard time getting along with. Ask God to give this person insight into the nature of their personal problems and to give you the strength to let God's love flow through you to them. I invite you to ask God to give you sensitivity to the needs of one person that you can show God's love to in word or deed today. I invite you to ask God for help with your personal problems, for help with those habits, hang-ups, and hurts that cause you to, uh, to stumble and, and have pain in this life. I invite you to ask God for help achieving your goals. For God to show you the next faithful step and to give you the courage to take it. And I invite you now to ask God this question and to listen with all that you have for God's reply. Lord, what do you want to do through me? Gracious God, we thank you. We thank you for this time of prayer. We thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for our church and our place in your family. We ask you to give us truly grateful hearts and let us show forth our gratitude and praise for you, not only with our lips, but in our lives. For we pray in the name of your son, Jesus, and together the people of God said, amen. Amen. So in just a few moments, we're going to continue with our worship by the giving of our tithes, gifts, and offerings. I want to invite those who are assisting uh, with that, if they will, to come forward at this time. Uh, your gifts are what makes it possible for us to do all of the ministry here at Broadmoor. One of the things I love about our church is that we're a seven-day-a-week congregation. Seven days a week there are things happening, and that is especially uh, evident uh, this weekend. This is one of the weekends when we host Walk to Emmaus, which is a 72-hour spiritual retreat. Uh, the Women's Walk is this weekend, and your gifts in part have made it possible for them to have this time set apart to be with Christ and to encounter God in a special and life-transforming way. 
So we appreciate every gift that you give. It's what makes it possible for us to do everything. As we prepare to give, I invite you to, uh, to reach into your pocket to find the extra dollar that makes a difference, knowing that it really is having an impact on people's lives, and it is transforming lives and transforming our community. Let us pray. Gracious God, receive now these gifts. Bless and multiply them. Let them be food for the hungry, clothing for the naked, medicine for the sick, shelter for those without a home. For we give them in Jesus' name. Amen. Every time I try to make it on my own Every time I try to stay, stop to fall And all those lonely roads that I traveled on If there was Jesus When the life I built came crashing to the ground When the friends I had were nowhere to be found I could see it then, but I can see it now That was Jesus Blessing buried in the broken pieces. Every minute, every moment, where I've been and where I'm going, even when I didn't know, I couldn't see it. There was Jesus. kind of grace for forgiveness said the price I couldn't pay I'm not perfect so I think God every day that was Jesus Shadows of the alleys. There was Jesus in the fire and in the flood. And there was Jesus. Always is, always was. No, I never woke up. Every minute, every moment, we're happy where I'm going. Even when I didn't know, couldn't see you. There was Jesus. Colleague, Dr. Terry Ellis with us. Uh, Dr. Ellis 
is an author and founder of Chrysalis Intervention, uh, Chrysalis Interventions, an Addiction and Intervention Mission. Uh, he holds a doctorate in Greek, a master's in biblical studies, a BA in psychology, and over his 34-year pastoral career, he served six churches. He's also a recovering alcoholic, and he first encountered uh, the serenity prayer, which he credits in treatment for his alcoholism in 2013, and God used the words of the serenity prayer to help save his life and restore his soul. Uh, the book that he has written, Reasonably Happy, is a line-by-line -line reflection on this beautiful, beautiful prayer, and it is my great pleasure and a great, uh, great honor for our congregation to welcome a friend and colleague, somebody who God has used to, to help literally save uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of lives in our community as people battled with addiction and people have uh, reached out to him for help. So Terry, thank you so much for being here this morning. Welcome to Broadmoor. Thank, thank you. Johnny. Thank you. Good morning, Broadmoor United Methodist Church. Good to be back with you. I've been here uh, one other time on Sunday morning and spoken to you, and it's always a pleasure to be asked to come back, uh, whether it was to just give me another chance to try to get it right or because you enjoyed it, that's, that's either one will be fine with me. Donnie, it's good to see you, my friend, and thank you again for your leadership in addressing this issue that's a part of our lives today. So many people struggle in the shadows. We'll talk more about that in a few moments, but uh, just a, again, a thank you to Broadmoor United Methodist Church. Again, I've spoken here, I've spoken at Holy Chow, which I think is a great name, and had a good time with that. And uh, the Seekers Sunday School class has spoken there a few times. So Broadmoor United Methodist Church is kind of one of my uh, adopted families as well. So God bless you for your work here, your continued faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And thank you for your warm welcome. I really appreciate it. And one thing I'd like to say before I get into the message in, um, in detail is um, thank you for your support of recovery, not just in having this Sunday, which is huge. It says a lot to um, the community, the recovery community at large in Baton Rouge, to know that there are churches that are willing to take this stand and to say, uh, we, we're going to help you. We're going we're to pull back the curtain of shame and silence around this, and we're going to talk about it. And there is a reason for hope, and that a lot of people that are getting well and this kind of thing, that's huge. But also, and do not overlook this, I think you host at Broadmoor United Methodist, about 12 AA meetings a week. Uh, I don't know the exact number, but it's, it's double figures. And I just want to say, good work. Um, we don't talk about our personal involvement in AA. We don't want to do anything to say, look, I'm an AA guy. Suffice it to say, I am familiar with a program that shall remain anonymous. And I can simply say to you, thank you for giving opportunity to any of us who may need that. And if you have somebody who's struggling with this, if you have somebody that you think has a problem with drugs or alcohol, go see your pastor. Uh, Donnie may call me to come in and talk with the people. That'd be fine. But if you know someone in the congregation who is in recovery, and we're everywhere, by the way, just speak a word to them. And we love to hear, that person will love to hear about how they might be able to reach out and say, look, just come with me, come, come to a meeting. And that is a tremendously effective way of helping someone who's living in the darkness. One other thing, too, the music was great. I appreciate very much all the, uh, the talents that are represented there and all the hard work and rehearsals and whatnot. And I love the way Eric's up here, just kind of laid back, putting his feet up, enjoying being up here. But it was really good. Thank you for the music. Why is it important to have this day? It's important to have this day because of the kind of phone call that I often get, and the latest one was maybe 10 days ago, a call about a family who has lost a loved one. In this case, it was a 23-year-old young man uh, who got a hold of some drugs that had too much fentanyl in them. And uh, he overdosed and died. And um, that, let me just say, I'm also working with another young man right now. He's 23. He has lost seven people, seven young men, 
over the course of his years who were in his high school with him. Now, I, when I heard that, I, th- I started thinking, I'm 65 years old. When was I, how old was I when I could say I've lost seven friends? I, and I, I, I started to kind of add them up. I was well into my 50s probably, and I'm not even sure that's accurate. That's what we're dealing with. There are 110,000 people, according to the latest statistics, that died from overdose deaths last year. 75,000 of those were from fentanyl or opioids. All right. The other, what, 45,000 or 35,000 are from uh, all the others, benzos, uh, meth, uh, the the amphetamines, um, uh, cocaine, etc. 120,000 people dying from that. There are 140,000 who die from alcoholism, and I can assure you that that number is tremendously underreported because it does not count those who were under the influence when they had an accident and they died. And God forbid kill somebody else, but that person will not be listed as an alcohol-related death or death from alcoholism. It does not count the... uh, Thousands and thousands of people who battle and lose the battle to some kind of hepatic or liver disease. It doesn't count those who have some form of esophageal cancer or any of the other half dozen, six or ten cancers that can be directly related to alcohol abuse. All that to say, I'm sure that it is hundreds of thousands of people who die from alcoholism. And that's ghastly. And those are the headlines that we get those are, the, uh, those are the phone calls that some of you get that are just alarming and so disheartening. That's a concern, absolutely. It's devastating. It pales into comparison to the thousands, millions of people who live in the shadows and they're dealing with addiction to some degree. And there are millions and millions of those people. And you're, they're, they're suffering from uh, lost uh, family members, broken marriages, damaged relationships with their, uh, their children, lost work, lost jobs, uh, personal health, again, being compromised in a, a dozen different ways or more. On and on it goes. And they're living a kind of shadowy existence. And it just goes on day and day, day in and day out, on and on. Now, why do we have a day like this? Because There are about 25 million Americans who are suffering with some degree of what is called substance use disorder, and that includes alcohol and drugs. 25 million. That's about 1 in 12 to 15 American adults right now struggling with that. And again, those are the headlines that grab our attention and we just shake our heads and we go, my goodness, what are they thinking? What's going on? How, what's go, where, where's our nation heading? That's what they're thinking. That's what we see when we see the headline. What I want to say to you this morning is, I'm not up here to say, oh, what a terrible thing this is. What a horrible, horrible thing, which is so sad, so bad. It is. I want you to have hope. Because with 25 million people struggling with some degree of substance use disorder, there are 23 million people who are living in long-term recovery today. I'm one of them. And there are others in this congregation who I've met. And my job, my calling from God, is to add to the 23 million. And any time that I can get a fine pastor like Donnie to say, come to our church, talk about this, I can assure you there will be people that will be added to the 23 million as a result of your commitment this morning. So again, thank you. God bless you. Broadmoor United Methodist Church. The text that I've chosen this morning is from Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 2. It really describes well the nature of the spiritual disease that we face in addiction. It is a spiritual disease, and it requires a spiritual solution. In Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 2, the prophet said, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shined. What a beautiful metaphor for addiction and recovery. Living in the darkness, stepping into the light. Day by day, living in the shadows, but then something calls you to step into the light and life changes. 
In the book of Isaiah, light and darkness, seeing and blindness are major themes sprinkled throughout the, uh, the, the prophet. Jesus, when he was asked by his disciples, why do you speak in parables? He replied with a passage from Isaiah, and it's that mysterious passage where Jesus said, so that hearing they won't hear and seeing they won't see. Well, thanks a lot, Jesus, you know, for that. I really appreciate it. It sounds like you're trying to obscure things. He was not trying to obscure things. He's simply saying that there is a spiritual sight that we all need. And to get it, we got to come to God. And we don't get it by saying, I got this figured out. I can do this on my own. No, that does not work. There is a deeper spiritual insight, a deeper spiritual way of seeing and hearing that the people of God can attain. But you got to want it. You got to work for it. You got to be faithful. You got to endure. Step into the light is what I've titled the sermon because that's what I want you to do. And when I say step into the light, I'm not talking just to uh, people who are struggling with addiction. That's the challenge of coming and speaking in churches like I often do. This is not just a sermon about people who are addicted. So don't please sit around and think, well, I hope it helps him or I hope it helps her. That's not it. You've got, you've got to realize all of us struggle with the darkness. All of us, some form of darkness. You're not addicted to drugs and alcohol. I pray you're not. I hope you're not. But do you struggle with eating? Do you struggle with pornography? Do you struggle with Amazon? Always gets nervous titters throughout the congregation. We have to process the daily inventory at my house when we get home. It's just the way it is. But those are substitutes. Those are ways for a lot of people, and don't, I'm not trying to lay a guilt trip on anybody. I'm just saying that we can put a lot of things as a substitute for I'm feeling a little uncomfortable, X will make me feel better. And that X can be a drug, it can be alcohol, it can be purchasing something online, which you don't really need, and the credit card statements say that, or getting online and, and going to sites you shouldn't go to, the eating, all that kind of thing. They're just a dozen different ways that we can get in trouble and try to fill that spiritual vacuum that we've got. When I speak to churches, I often say, you know, you may have known this day was coming and you thought, oh, great, maybe Bob will be there. Well, if Bob is one who is literally struggling with alcoholism or drug, I can just about assure you, Bob is not the kind that comes to this type of service. Uh, they don't want to necessarily uh, face that, which is the way it is. But who is here today are the family members. And you've got somebody that's struggling, and you don't know what to do. And you've talked to them, and you've prayed for them, and you've cussed them, and you've done everything you know to do. This Sunday is for you as well. So all of us, let's find a way to step into this passage about the light and the darkness. Let's take a look at our own shadows. How can we step out of those and step into the light? The darkness that I faced, well, it'll be 10 years this coming November that I stepped out of that darkness. Somebody suggested that I step out of that darkness, and I took the advice and went to treatment, and then got into a fellowship, and stepped out of that darkness. But if you were to go back 10 years plus one month, and for a couple of years before that, it was bad. It was so bad that when I woke up in the morning, and I could see, if I slept, by the way, if I woke up in the morning and could see the the first light of dawn, I would curse because I had lived through the night. And there was a a big, big part of me that was wanting nothing more than for the Widowmaker to kick in. Let me just get out of this. Leslie gets the insurance. I get out of the pain. It's a very self-centered way to look at life, but that's what addiction does. It is a black hole of self-interest and self-obsession. That's where I was. How did I get there? I mean, Donnie read my credentials, and I'm not going to go over them. I was not on that track 
all right? I was on a track that was a lot different, and I had lived a long time without drinking. And when I say without drink, I mean, I just didn't drink. It was not in my life at all. But when I was about 50 years old, things started happening, uh, family problems, uh, churches are churches. They can occasionally, some of you can occasionally be challenging. Just let me leave it there, okay? And then I had a, uh, my brother was murdered. So I just had some things that happened, just blow after blow after blow. And I got depressed. I can see that now. I didn't really realize it at the time. And then I got despairing, couldn't sleep, anxious. And somebody suggested, why don't you have a glass of wine uh, just to settle down? And I'm not condemning that. I'm not saying that y'all need to stop. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that for me, I had a monster in my head, and I didn't know it. And when I took the drink, it woke up. And that began, you know, people say, how do you, you get there? I said, well, little by little and suddenly. It just happened little by little. I didn't wake up one day and say, I'm going to be an alcoholic. That's what I'm going to do. I'm just done with this. Alcoholism is the way forward for Terry Ellis. That's not the way it happened. How do any of us get to darkness? I've just taken a couple of steps into the shadows and a few more steps in the shadows. We get used to that level of darkness and we step a little further. And on and on and go, you go, and suddenly you're in a place where you can't see anything. And that's where I was. Addiction is the result of, and it affects everything that makes us human. Genetics, environment, intellect, volition, and most importantly, the spirit. I am... Um, and one of my challenges is to try to get people to understand what it's like to be addicted. It, it's, it is a darkness, that's without question. Um, but sometimes, and people have said this has helped, so let me suggest this to you. Try not eating for three or four days. Nothing. And then try not thinking about food. And that's what it's like to be addicted to drugs or alcohol every single day. It takes over. I am a Lord of the Rings nerd. And I am rereading Lord of the Rings. It's been about 10 years, maybe more now. But I told Leslie earlier, I'm going to reread Lord of the Rings. And I was reading the other night and um, came across a passage. And I said, Leslie, listen to this. I'm in bed. And she's in bed. She's trying to sleep. But it's important to her that she hear my thoughts when she's trying to doze off, right? So I, I said, listen to this passage. It's Gandalf explaining to Frodo about the ring, right, and its effect and how it takes over an individual. Gandalf says this, And if he often uses the ring to make himself invisible, he fades. He becomes in the end invisible permanently and walks in the twilight under the eye of the dark power that rules the rings. Yes, sooner or later, later if he's strong or well-meaning to begin with, but neither strength or goodwill will last, Sooner or later, the dark power will devour him. Bingo. What Tolkien wrote uh, poetically, uh, prosaically, so beautifully, uh, Dr. Gabor Mate uh, writes about in his book uh, describing genetics. And Gabor Mate is a, um, he's a physician in uh, Vancouver. He works with the very worst of us. But he wrote this. He said, one consequence of spiritual deprivation is addiction. And not only to drugs. He goes on. At conferences devoted to science-based addiction medicine, it's more and more common to hear presentations on the spiritual aspect of addictions and their treatment. Uh, by the way, I get invited to speak at these conventions sometimes. I'm not a psychiatrist, psychologist. I'm not, even, I'm not a licensed counselor. I'm a doctorate in theology. I understand a few things about the spiritual world. And they say, come and tell us about it. And I do. Dr. Mate goes on. The object, form, and severity of addictions are shaped by many influences. Social, political, and economic status, personal and family history, physiological, genetic predispositions. But at the core of all addictions lies the spiritual void. At the core of all addictions lies a spiritual void. I know that void. And all of us know that void. 
What are you trying to fill it with? I tried to fill it with a bottle. Other people try to fill it with a needle or a pill or a leaf or Amazon or gambling or what all the others. Nothing fills that. Kierkegaard said it years ago. It's a God-shaped void. And only God can fill it. All of this that we do here, and I, I'm a church lover. I really do love, love, love the church. All the church stands for, the art, the, the music, the clergy, the vestments in more traditional services and all that kind of thing. All of these things that we talk about, the, the uh, creeds that we recite, all of this is designed to conform you internally to shape you in the image of Christ. That, as Paul wrote, that we may have the mind of Christ. Or as he wrote repeatedly, that you may be a man or a woman in Christ. Or as Peter wrote in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, that you may become a partaker of the divine nature. Wow. That you may become a partaker of the divine nature. That was a theme. Take a little... Uh, a little diversion here for just a moment because it's important. In the first few centuries, the first three centuries or so, before Augustine, this idea of becoming a partaker in the divine nature was a central theme of the Christian proclamation. Uh, Augustine changed the, the uh, dialogue a little bit and it became more justification, that kind of thing. We don't need to go into that. But this idea of becoming a partaker of the divine nature is called theosis or divinization is that God wants to make you more like Him. And I say that reverently. And I say that without a clear understanding of exactly what that means, other than to say, it sounds fantastic. That's what God has planned for you. And that's what church is designed to be. Not just a place where you come and evaluate. It's a place where you come and you're asking God, change me from within. Conform me to the life of your Son. Help me to be more like Jesus. Here's the darkness, God, that I've been dealing with this past week. Would you please help me step further into the light? That's what's supposed to be happening here. Look, it's very possible, and I was a pastor of Broadmoor Baptist Church. That was my last church. It's possible to have all the trappings of religion, and I did some good work. I'm not bragging. I'm just saying I did some good work, but I was so self-reliant. And I didn't realize it and how much that became a, a point of weakness, a proclivity that opened me up to stepping into the darkness. When you rely on yourself, the shadows gather. And then life happens. The trauma hits, brothers murder, family problems, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then the spiritual vacuum becomes even more real. I never stopped believing in God. It's just that God, during those years, He was like a distant bonfire. I could see the light. He's there. But I felt no warmth. I could just see it. I knew it was there. That's pretty much it. If I were to boil down the central question of addiction, and not just addiction, of life itself, I would say that the question is this, and you can ask yourself this question. How do I handle pain? How do I handle difficulty? How do I handle suffering? Most of us, and culturally it's becoming magnified, we retreat to all of these unhealthy things that I've ticked off. You feel a little stress, you feel a little discomfort, do something that gives you relief. There's nothing wrong with that to a certain degree, but when it begins to interfere with your life with God, your relationships with others, your personal health, then you've crossed a line that's very clear and very obvious. How do you handle pain? Just deny it? Just try to avoid it? Always trying to avoid it? Yeah, it's impossible. Remember M. Scott Peck's book, uh, The Road Less Traveled? Been a long time since that book was written. 
The first line in it was this, life is difficult. And I remember, and I was a young man, probably in seminary at the time, and people were talking about, wow, that's amazing. Life is difficult. I'm thinking, that, that's new to you? I mean, life, is, that's new? I mean, Jesus was very clear about it. All the, all the, let me put it this way. All the wisest people that have ever lived for about 5,000 years have been trying to tell us that very fact. It's just surprising how often every generation has to discover it again. Oh, yeah, life is hard. If you look in the Bible, Jesus said, in the world, you're going to have tribulation. James talked about the reality of suffering. He even said rejoice in it, which we don't have time to get into that. But my goodness, really? Possible. Uh, first Peter, uh, Peter in the first letter, wrote, Do not be surprised when suffering comes, as if something strange were happening to you. In other words, he's just saying, look, this is life. And again, the question is, what do you do when the pain hits? And what I'm suggesting to you is, instead of taking a drug to numb your discomfort, or by endlessly complaining, or by fleeing away from the faith, instead of doing that, by the way, fleeing away to what? What's your option, right? Instead of doing any of those things, take a look at the discomfort. Find the fault that may be within you, own it, and then take a step toward God. I noticed in, in uh, that beautiful pastoral prayer that Donnie led us through, he asked us to think about a sin that we struggle with in the last 20, I think he said 24 hours. He only gave us three minutes or so to review that. It could, I could have gone on, right? We have those struggles. We have those discomforts. We have the difficulties. What do you do with them? Why don't you try this? Step toward the light. God knows the darkness, and He says, come to the sun. Come to Jesus. God understands the darkness. That's why Jesus is described as the light of the world. Come to the light. Step into the light. We all struggle here. Uh, you know, in some liturgies, right before they have the Eucharist, they will say, Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. Lord, say the word. Every one of us here needs healing. Every one of us here needs healing. He came to my desk with a quivering lip. The lesson was done. Have you a new sheet for me, dear teacher? I spoiled this one. I took his sheet all soiled and blotted and gave him a new one, all unspotted. And into his tired heart I said, do better now, my child. I went to the throne with a trembling heart. The day was done. Have you a new day for me, dear master? I've spoiled this one. He took my day all soiled and blotted and gave me a new one all unspotted. And into my tired heart, he said, do better now, my child. This is the God of light who is inviting every one of us to step out of the darkness. It's time. If you're struggling with drugs or alcohol, one of these other shadows, it's time. That's not going to give you the peace that you need. It's going to create more discord in your life. It's time to step into the shadows. It's time to step out of the shadows. It's time to step into the light. And that's where this wonderful church comes back into play. Broadmoor United Methodist Church is saying to every member, it's saying to the entire community, if you struggle in this area, we understand you here, we love you here, and we can help you here. You are not made to live in the shadows. You are a child of the light. Step into the light. Let us pray together. God, thank you so much for the light of Jesus Christ. Thank you for the gospel that has saved us. Thank you that we have an opportunity by coming to church and participating in the disciplines of faith to have our souls more conformed to your image, to become partakers in your divine nature. God, we've all struggled with shadows this week. We've struggled with them perhaps for many years. May this day be a day when we take further steps toward you and the light. I pray your blessings on this wonderful church, each member, and especially those who struggle and their families. Bless them, Lord, and lead us all back to the light. In his name we pray. 
Amen.